We'll talk about that in detail for sure in a whole episode. That's a part of the series, right? How to talk to my doctor. Mm-hmm. Talk to your doctor. I think about those like pharmaceutical ads. Talk to your doctor. <laughs> If this is right for you. Hi, Tina. Hi, Leah. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to hear. Yeah. So here we are with our second episode of our Talk to Your Doctor pod. And in our last episode, we talked about how to approach the subject of integrative medicine with your physician. So how do you talk to your oncologist about incorporating integrative medicine into your cancer care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we went over the generalities of that, right? In the first episode. Yep. And now we are going to talk about questions that you can ask at your appointments. And also like, kind of like, you know, what to bring to appointments. And so this is kind of more for, you know, maybe somebody who hasn't been to see the doctor yet, or just, you know, you can think of these questions for follow-up appointments. Yeah. Or maybe even if they're ongoing, but they hadn't thought of a few of these things. I think some stuff we're going to talk about today may not be top of mind. It's things you wish you had done if you had known ahead of time to do it before your appointments. Right, right. And so this is also good for anyone who maybe knows someone who is going, who has received a diagnosis and is going to go in to, um, to meet with their doctors. And yeah. Oh, and then I guess, lastly, we're going to kind of cover what happens if maybe you don't like your doctor and you want to switch. Right. Or what if your doctor leave? What if they leave the center where they are? Like what, you know, kind of what happens. So. Yeah. 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 So I think it's all, it's all relevant. It all happens a lot because there's a lot of turnover in medicine these days, it seems a lot of movement um, as well as retirements. So yeah. So let's get into the first subject, which is how to prep and what to bring to those first appointments, how to go about making sure you get the most out of those oncology visits. Yeah. So when we talked about this earlier this week, you came up with a great idea, which it seems kind of obvious, but it was bringing questions, like write down questions as you think of them before your appointment. And this can apply to anybody. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you get to the doctor's appointment and they're like, do you have any questions? And you're like, crickets are like chirping between the ears. As soon as you think of those questions, put them down in your phone, have a little notebook. So, you know, coming prepared with questions beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Yes, writing them down is key because you think you're going to remember because it might be a question you are pondering and it doesn't leave your mind. Of course, by the time you go through the routine of getting in the room and having your records updated and you're sitting there and the oncologist comes in, there's a lot going on and you might go blank, right? Having it written in front of you, whether it's on your phone, on an iPad, on a piece of paper, but having that list of things that occurred to you Uh, beforehand is really important, no matter how good your memory already is, because something happens in the room and, you know, it's hard to on the spot pull up questions that you might have. Right. Or you could, you know, kind of get like sidetracked and and not remember it, because I've actually had notes to ask my doctor on my phone. And then we start talking about something else. And then it completely like I she leaves the room and I was like, oh, I never asked these questions. So. Yep. Yep. So I think it's really important before the first visit to sit quietly and ask yourself what aspects of the treatment are you most anxious about? Are you most concerned about what is really important to you so that you write in that kind of getting to know you visit, or it could be, you know, halfway through treatment too, but what's really important if you're are really nervous about pain, for example, or you're really nervous about the nausea vomiting aspect or how it's going to affect your sleep, or, you know, you're worried about how you're going to function on your day to day, your quality of life, what aspects, be really specific about what aspects of your life are you most worried about changing after treatment. So I'll give you an example. I had people who are musicians, you know, and one of the most important things to them is their fingertips. 
Right. I had a woman who was a violinist in an orchestra. And the one thing she didn't want to lose was the dexterity and the feeling in her fingertips. It was everything to her. Now, that's an extreme example, right? But making sure on whatever level of side effects that you might be concerned about, just put that on your list. You may be worrying about something that's not going to happen. Right, right. And I, I think that is a really good point about bringing up the concern that is most important to you, whether it's how is this going to affect my work? How is this going to affect my hobbies? How is this going to affect my day-to-day, my relationship with my children? All of that. Those are the really important questions that you might not think of until later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And quality of life is something that you should bring up. Your quality of life, only you know, right? You see the doctor for however long in that office. The job of the oncologist is to focus on your cancer and you need to bring up other topics. I mean, they will query you. They'll ask you about pain. They'll ask you about symptoms that are side effects of the given treatment. But at the same time, your quality of life is not top of mind for the doctor as much as it's top of mind for you because you're the one undergoing treatment and you know better than anyone what's happening. Right. And then all of these notes that you're taking, if you get any handouts from the doctor's office, having one central place to keep everything. So getting a three ring binder. Mm Mm-hmm is, you know, a trapper keeper. If you're, if you're of a Oh, gosh. Age. Remember trapper keepers? Gosh. They had pockets in them because not everything has holes. And so putting lab reports, if you get summaries of your visit, anything. Sometimes the nurses or nurse navigators will print out about your medications, mm-hmm. what medications you're taking, even your medication list. Keep in your notebook and keep in your phone a list of the medications that you're taking, Mm -hmm. the supplements that you're taking, how often, and if you can take a photograph of the label, the front and the back of the label and have that on hand. Yeah, I think that's all good because you are going to be asked to share that information quite a bit, right? And over time, I think it's really important during treatment to make sure you yourself get a copy of all of the information, all of the drugs each time, even if it's at the end of your treatment and you just say, I'd like a release of my medical records to myself and you want to do a hard copy. And I say that because electronic medical records don't exist forever either. In most states, and I don't know the law in every state, but every state has a certain amount of time that your medical records need to be available, but it's not indefinite. And so In the state of Oregon, I believe it's seven years that we're legally obligated to keep medical records. And after that, back in the day when we destroyed paper, they could be shredded. What that means is if you are 10 years out or 15 years and you need to know what happened back when you got treatment for cancer, you might be SOL, right? So having a hard copy, even if you never read it, just getting it released, putting it in some kind of trapper keeper, (laughs) Trapper keeper. (laughs) Um, But just having that aside and just knowing that you have that file in your possession is probably a really good idea just for peace of mind, if nothing else, because there could be a day you need it and it's not available in the system. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so fortunate because this isn't cancer related, but as a kid, up till I was 18, I went to military hospitals. And so when my dad retired, we all got these folders, these orange folders with all of my military records, like my health records. So I have from like when I was born, I've got like the little footprints, like when I was first born and every, I mean, I've got all that information up until I was 18 or 17 when I went off to college because I Mm -hmm. stopped saving all of my medical records after then. But no, it's like such a cool thing to have. So with cancer treatment, I mean, there are many patients who I've talked to and I was like, so what chemo did you get 20 years ago? And they're like, I have no idea. Sure. And it changes. It changes so fast these days. Yeah, it is a good thing just to kind of keep that on hand. So have Mm -hmm. your little vault of information that you can keep Mm -hmm. and you don't have to carry it with you, but just know when you go home from an appointment to put those in there, any recommendations that are made at your appointment. Yeah. And it's really interesting because what is in your medical chart, your official medical chart doesn't always look like what you're looking at from a patient portal perspective, like your actual reports are there where your patient record sometimes is a watered down version of that. They don't give you explicit detail. Um, I'll use a mammogram for an example. Like when you have a mammogram and you get a letter or you get a note in your patient portal, it might just read 
no findings or it was unremarkable. You know, all these phrases. Right. Two that thumbs we, up. <laughs> all these phrases we have in medicine. But your report, your actual mammogram has a lot more information on it, you know, that has the findings, your risk of breast cancer over time, your your BIRADS score. The BIRADS is the score from zero to five for the findings. So these are more informative pieces of information in your official medical chart that you don't always get through a patient portal. Yeah, those are all good things for patients to request. And it's Mm -hmm. your right. I mean, that's what you're signing. Since 1994. Yes, your medical records are your own. Yeah, since 1994, there's there's a federal act that those records are not the possession of anyone but the person they're recording. So with your permission, they can be dispersed to other entities, but it is your possession. And you can get imaging on CDs too, Mm -hmm. which sounds so archaic, but sometimes it's nice to have that in your file. Mm -hmm. One last thing to bring to your appointment, and it's not available to everybody, but um, try to bring another person, try to bring another set of ears Mm -hmm. who also has their own notebook to write down because yeah, there have been times where two people hear something different, especially in this, the times the times of COVID, we're not necessarily able to bring somebody with us to some appointments. But if you are able, whether it's a friend, a relative, just find someone that can accompany you to an appointment. Yeah. And that reminds me of the other thing that I think we all can do now, or most people have the capacity to do, and that is to record the visit. I mean, I think that even if you have someone with you, there are times when you hear one thing, they hear another. And if you had a recording, you could probably break that tie, right? You could probably figure out what was actually right. said. So I, if you can get permission, ideally get permission from the office, from the doctor themselves to record the visit, that is really valuable. And you might not need to listen to it, but it's there if you have questions like, did they say this or did they say that? So it's, it's it can be really useful. I find it tremendously useful, actually. Um, and I have people record the visits they've had with me. I don't mind people recording that. I think definitely how you approach it. I've had patients recording it in all different spectrums. I mean, I, I I walked in the room once and it was like the guy had a recording studio pretty much set up in there. I mean, he had everything all laid out and it was like really intimidating. It's really easy just to just hold up your phone and say, I'm really nervous. I forget things. I want to make sure I have this information correct. Mm -hmm. May I record? Some states, you don't have to tell people if you're recording them. In Arizona, only one person in a party needed to know if they were being recorded. And that could be the person recording. So people mm-hmm. could have recorded us and we had no idea. But just, you know, put it out there and say, can I turn on yeah. my recorder, my phone? Yes. And I don't know about Androids, but I know on Apple, it's just called a voice memo. It's so, it's so simple. It's already in, it's an right. app that's always on there. You click record on voice memo and it will just keep recording until you hit stop. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's high on the to do list, too, especially when you're first going through it and you might have a lot of anxiety and it makes it hard to think and hard to remember. And, you know, phrases are coming at you and it's new jargon, all of that stuff. Yeah. And you get caught up on one thing that they're saying. They're saying one part of a whole spectrum of things Mm -hmm. and you're caught up and then you might miss another part of that. So, yeah, that's a good tip. So those are the kinds of things to bring to to the doctor's appointment itself. And that brings us to the next part, which is what do we ask at these appointments? Mm-hmm. There are so many questions to ask at the appointment. And cancer.net has a free app that has this extensive list of questions to ask. And so we kind of picked out some of the questions that we thought, you know, we could embellish on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just so people know, cancer.net is part of ASCO, A-S-C-O, right? It's the patient facing aspect of ASCO. And what is ASCO? The American Society of Clinical Oncology. I put you on the spot. That's right. That's (laughs) right. I appreciate that. Um, They can be very specific questions, but they can be very general questions, right? I think one of the things that I like people to ask is what the intent of the treatment is. Yeah. Is it curative or palliative? Yeah. 
there's a why in the road and the medical oncologist or surgical oncologist you're talking to knows in their mind which road they're taking. And the terminology is curative intent or palliative intent. And it doesn't mean it doesn't mean cure is off the table if you're on, under palliative intent, but intent is literal. Like, what is the intent of this treatment? If it's one that they don't believe they have the tools to cure, it will be palliative intent by definition, because there's only two roads to take, right? If it's one that they believe, okay, if we line up these particular treatments, whatever they are, a certain number of people are cured, then it's a curative intent. So it's important to know that right in the beginning, because that frames a lot of their decision making going forward. I think that that's a great thing to know. Personally, with my mom, when she was going through treatment, I don't think she quite understood the goal of the treatment, mm-hmm. even though it was, you know, repeated mm-hmm. quite often. Yeah, it's, um, it can be confusing, mm-hmm. but I think it is really good information to have and then write that down. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, I can tell you with with broad strokes, there's a truism to this. And that is, when something is meant to cure, then there's going to be less likely any any reduction of dose, any delay of treatment, any you know it's it's less likely to happen. Their their quality of life is there; it's considered, but it's curative. So what they're hoping is to get you through the fires and the flames of treatment to the other side, so you can lead a normal life again, right? So you're aiming for cure. So you're going to maybe prioritize quality of life a little less than you would during palliative treatment when quality of life is very much higher on the concern list because you're going to be undergoing treatment for quite some time. So the quality of your life over the longer term horizon just becomes more of a consideration during the palliative treatments. And I think kind of going off of like, you know, what is the intent of my treatment you know, asking what are my treatment options? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there might be an oral pill option instead of getting an IV chemo. I mean, you know, what are the various options for the specific cancer that I have? And know that it's okay to go look for a second opinion. Yes, always. I think it's really important. Yeah. It's reassuring if you go get a second opinion and they tell you exactly what the first opinion said. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, good. I know I'm on the right track. Yeah. I think there's never anything wrong with, with getting a second opinion. And we've all, I'm sure heard stories of people who have gotten second opinions and may have gotten a slight change in their diagnosis, whether for the better or the worst. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and say to the doctor, I'm going to, you know, get a second opinion on this. Yeah. And on that note, if you can, once you have a cancer diagnosis and you're getting a second opinion, go to somewhere that is not the same facility, right? Or maybe not even down the road. You want to go somewhere that has a high volume of the cancer. And so that might mean you go from a smaller community clinic to the bigger city down the road, however many hours away that is. But guaranteed, if there's a higher volume, they may be doing things. They may be doing things that are a little bit more cutting edge. There may be clinical trials that are appropriate. So, okay, this is a palliative treatment track you're on, but we're doing research and we're hoping that this will work in a curative way with some people. I mean, there's things that are happening in larger centers and academic centers that just aren't happening in our small community clinics. They just don't have the capacity for that. So I think that's important. A lot of folks also came to me and said, here's the treatment that was laid out by my oncologist. What do you think of it? And I always steered them towards the NCCN guidelines, which is what the oncologist was using. So the NCCN guidelines is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. There is a whole list of NCCN guidelines for patients on their website. Yeah. And so that is, it's an alliance of 31 cancer centers in the U.S. And I think most of them are designated with the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, as being comprehensive cancer centers. Mm -hmm. And they they are the guidelines that our local oncologists use. Those algorithms are what are being used to determine treatment in most clinical settings. Yeah. So I can put a link in our show notes to the guidelines for patients, um, because there is kind of a patient 
aspect mm-hmm. of it and a physician aspect. And so the patient side is much easier to read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know this, this, this part is probably like pretty basic, but it is good to know exactly what type of cancer you have, knowing the stage, knowing if you have a solid tumor, knowing the size of the tumor, you know, like knowing if there is cancer elsewhere in, in your body, where it is. And this sounds like such a basic thing to say, but there are often times where people think that they have separate cancers because there's cancer in their brain and there's cancer in their lungs. And mm-hmm. it's actually the same cancer. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's not, sometimes it is two separate cancers, but it's really, really important, especially when you go to your family practice doctor, they can get your records, but you will know what your tumor is, what your stage is, Mm -hmm. and then ask the doctor, what does that mean? Because stage four for one cancer might be something different for stage four for a different cancer. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. There are certain, certain cancers where stage four is even curable. And we don't hear that a lot. People hear stage four and think the worst, but some subtypes of cancer that are even curable at stage four. Yeah. Again, that kind of lends itself to knowing what your initial diagnosis is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that that kind of helps. And then also knowing what your treatments are, writing all these down and keeping records of that. Mm-hmm. Um, really important question. And it, you'll probably get this information when you receive your treatment plan. But knowing what the possible side effects, both short term and long term, can be of a treatment and knowing how it will affect your day to day, asking like, how will this affect my sex life? How will this affect my ability to exercise? You know, even with the port placement, like that was a really big question with people was like, how soon can I do this? Can I pick up my child? You know, those kinds of things. Another question, and patients often ask this because it's kind of what you think of when you go through, especially chemotherapy is, you know, will I lose my hair with this treatment? Because not all treatments will cause hair loss. Some of them cause hair thinning. Some of them don't affect it at all. Mm -hmm. And I have had at least one, maybe two patients who came to their first appointment with shaved heads because they were anticipating losing their hair and then finding out that, yeah, no, not not with the treatment that you're going to be receiving. Right. And so, you know, they were kind of being preemptive and they're like, I'm just going to get rid of my hair because I know I'm going to lose it. And then it was like, no, you right. might not. And you most likely won't. So finding out specifically, like, is this going to affect my hair? Is this going to affect my nails? Is this going to give me neuropathy because I'm a guitarist? I play the piano. Yeah. And on that note, realizing that any experiences that you've witnessed or seen others go through for their particular cancer could be completely different than your own experience, right? So even if it is the same yeah. treatment and it is the same cancer, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You you can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah. So I think it's really important because we all learn from our own experiences through either vicariously or through our direct experience. So my thought is that you just ask as many questions as possible that are relevant for your scenario because you can't generalize very much. And you can in terms of the question of hair loss. Maybe everybody knows this, but I'm putting it out there. You can get a prescription to get a wig. Mm -hmm. It's the cranial prosthesis. I mean, that can be available through prescription from your doctor. And so definitely ask for that. I don't know if you always are offered a prescription, but ask and see if you can get one. Yeah, and usually most communities have wig centers that specialize in that. Some cancer centers have it right in-house, you know, under Mm -hmm. their roof. And other communities, I mean, there's usually people who sell wigs in the community that specialize in that. And they may know if they take insurance or if insurance covers it. Another important question is asking about seeing a fertility specialist before you begin your treatment asking, is this going to affect my ability to have children? And th- that that's a definite before your treatment question, if you can, if you can mm-hmm. get that in, because unfortunately that hasn't always been brought up at appointments. Yes. I, I've seen that. I think it seems like it's brought up more now than it used to be. Yes, sure. And maybe because there's a lot more options now. I mean, mm-hmm. this is for, for both sexes. Fertility preservation, I suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. Asking what other 
support services are available in terms of, is there, you know, are are there resources to help me manage the costs that come up? Mm -hmm. Um, Are there services available to my family? We had at the cancer center where I was, we had a social worker who was specific for working with families and children. Mm -hmm. And they have a room set up with toys, with dolls who didn't have hair, with books. And that was an incredible gift for us to have. Yeah, I think a lot of centers have that now, at least social workers that can help families deal with what's going on. And, you know, that brings up the point that cancer happens to an individual and their loved ones. It's not happening to one person. I think the more that that's acknowledged and the better people up front discuss the dynamics of that, whatever the family unit is, it doesn't matter. You know, it could be be kids, it could be parents, it could be, you know, your husband or wife. I actually, I think that it would be nice. I know it's not practical, but it would be nice if that was just part and parcel of the visits. Like that's what you do. You see the medical oncologist and you see the social worker, you know, it's challenging on relationships. Yeah. I mean, and that was a great resource that we did have at the Integrative Cancer Center was initially at first appointments, the very first time you come into the cancer center and you see the oncologist, I mean, you have a day loaded full, a day or Mm -hmm. two loaded full of appointments of seeing the social worker, the dietitian and all of that. So that was a really cool feature that we had at one point. But, you know, asking who is my nurse navigator? You know, who do I turn to for questions? Oftentimes these are, these are things that are provided to you, but make sure that you have this information in hand when you're receiving all of this news, you want to make sure that it's clear who you, who you're able to reach out to. If, if you need physical therapy, if you think you need physical therapy, if you think you need to see a dietitian, you know, where do I go? Who do I, who do I ask? Do you have referrals to different services? You know, on that note, some centers have a navigator, right? An actual patient navigator. So they call it nurse navigators or patient navigators or somebody at the center that their job is to make sure you as the patient are served. It's really important to have a point person because it's stressful and you don't need, you know, a dozen calls that don't get answered and all the stress that comes along with that. So finding a point person. Now, a lot of centers have a point person, like I said, if they don't, then you or a loved one, somebody needs to find a kind face behind the counter. And it could be one of the people who work at the desk. It could be the nurse that's working with your doctor. But you need to find that point person that is willing to, you know, talk to you, take your calls. You're not going to get to the oncologist every time. So you're going to have to find another way. Some systems have a nurse call in number. So there's always a nurse Right. It's like a triage number. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, for example, if you are at home and there's a fever, right, and you're you're like, I'm not sure if my thermometer is correct or not, but it looks like it's about 100. Am I supposed to go to urgent care for this or can we stay home because otherwise there's no symptoms? Like little questions that are going to arise along the way that you need a point person to ask these. And so figuring that out ahead of time saves you a lot of stress in the long run. Oh, for sure. We had mentioned getting printouts of labs and appointment notes, asking your doctor to explain your lab tests. I mean, oftentimes they're like, oh, your labs look fine. And then I would have patients come into my room and they're like, how come this is red? How come, you know, the doctor said that my labs are fine and I can get my treatment, but this is red and this is red and this is red. And then I would have to go through and explain it. So you can ask, like, can, you know, ask your doctor, like, can you explain Mm -hmm. why this is red, but it's okay because not everything is quite cut and dry on a lab test. Yes. And so asking for a printout and then having someone to be able to go over those lab results with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And looking for the trends yourself, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't out of range, but it keeps going higher every time I get a lab. Is this something I should be concerned with or not? And maybe that's not for everybody. Maybe some people just don't want to know and they don't want to stress out over it. Sure. And speaking of testing, is genetic testing something that needs to be done? Do my family members need to be tested? We're going to go more into that on the next episode, but that's a really good question for people to ask. Yeah. In the 
younger you are or the more family history you have of various cancers, the more important that that be Mm -hmm. asked and, you know, attention be paid to that, whether it's appropriate or not. But we'll talk about that in detail for sure in a whole episode. That's part of the series, right? How to talk to my doctor. Talk to your doctor. I think about those like pharmaceutical ads. Talk to your doctor. (laughs) If this is right for you. So asking your doctor, you know, are there, are there new clinical trials available? You know, do you know of another facility that might have a clinical trial available for me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I mentioned earlier that it's really important if it's a more obscure or a less common type of cancer that you go to get a second opinion at a center. They're called centers of excellence, like for, I don't know, a brain tumor, for example. Um, You want to go to a center that sees a lot of that type of tumor right. or sarcomas, for example. Mm-hmm. Those are the places that we'll know if there's clinical trials for rare and unusual cancers or less, I don't want to call them rare, less common cancers. Because the most common cancers are breast, prostate, colorectal, and lung. And behind that is ovarian and pancreatic. So those are the more common, like most community clinics see a decent amount of that. But there are subtypes of those cancers you listed, lung, breast, you know, that that may be less common. So there's a common overall cancer, but it's a less common subtype. And there might be doctors out there who specialize in that subtype. That's a good point. I guess, you know, another question is like, do I need to start treatment right away? Sometimes people have family events that are coming up and they don't want to go th- through chemo and then be immune compromised and then not able to attend mm-hmm. a child's wedding or a graduation. And so if there is an event coming up, you you know ask, does do I need to start right away? Am I able to you know go to go to my son's graduation or whatever right. it may be? Finding out the order of your treatment if there's going to be more than just chemotherapy, is there going to be radiation and surgery, all of those things? Yeah, that's a good point because some of these you have to really just get on and start treatment right away. Right. Some types of cancer and other ones can wait. It's not going to make any difference whether you wait a week or a few weeks, whatever the oncologist deems okay. Yeah. What happens, Tina, if I don't like my doctor? Oh, man. I've I've counseled <laughs> patients through this. This is That's rough. why I'm asking you. That's oh. why I'm asking. I've had it a couple of times where patients might not, you know, jive with the personality of an mm-hmm. oncologist. But yeah, I know that you have had experience with this. Well, you know, no one gets excited and clicks their heels to go see their cancer doctor in a general sense because it means you're going to the oncology center. <laughs> but it should at least be an experience that you're not dreading, right? So I, I use that as one gauge. Like, do you really dislike this person to the point where you don't want to be in the room. And my other gauge is, are they giving you good care? Like most of the time, the dislike is not even personal. It's more like they don't trust them or they don't feel like the doctor is listening or present or respectful. If that's the case, then I help them find another. There's always a hierarchy in the room, but a respectable relationship, you know, being respected is still part of the bargain. Absolutely. Uh, So I feel like if there is disrespect, if they're being blown off, I usually listen to the patient and the patient usually decides themselves whether they want to stick with that doc or not. Because sometimes, obviously, finding a new one can be so stressful that it's just not worth it the effort. You know, we're talking about this, gosh, it sounds a lot like a breakup, doesn't it? It totally does. And, you know, the relationship you form with your oncologist, I mean, I, I mean, I had patients that really enjoyed coming because everybody treated them with so much respect. Yeah. And then we had an oncologist who happened to be my oncologist and they left. Mm-hmm. They left to go to another facility. And he told me as his colleague, we were in the cafeteria in the morning and we we're getting breakfast and I see him and I wave and he was like, oh, did I mention to you that I'm leaving? And I just remember like all the color left from my face and immediately my eyes filled up with tears. I felt like someone just took me to a restaurant to break up with me. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he quite expected that reaction from me. And I was just like in the cafeteria, like, oh, 
Like I didn't know how to cope because it is, you put your life into this person's hands Mm -hmm. and you trust them and then they leave you. And, um, I mean, I remember like thinking like, cause he was just going to be on the other side of the Valley. And I'm thinking like, do I follow him? Do I stay? And then I'm like, I know myself, I'm really lazy. I'm not going to go driving across the state of Arizona to go see my oncologist. And so they brought on a new oncologist who worked with the breast cancer patients and I love her and Mm -hmm. I get excited to see her, but it is hard. Yeah. Like, I mean, what do you do when you're, when your doctor leaves you? Right. Well, when the doctor leaves, at least I guess you, you, like you did, you know, you find your next best and you soldier on. If you want to change your doctor, it can be complicated if you are in a small town or a small city and there's not a lot of choices. One, by virtue of being small, they all know each other. Two, I have had patients told they cannot change, which I think is... Red flag? Yeah, just shy of ludicrous is what I was going to say. Um, your task at that point, if you really don't like this person and you really don't feel like you can trust them, because more important than anything is the trust, then you have to talk to the clinic manager, and it's the clinic manager that you have to appeal to to say, I can't be with this person for these reasons, and make sure they're good reasons, right? You don't trust them is a good reason. Sometimes it's not easy, and a loved one who is good at such things is sometimes useful too, right? Whether that's your sibling or parent or whomever. So those are all really good points about, you know, if you want to leave your doctor, what happened with me where my doctor left me and not just me, all of us, um, you know, and another specialist was brought in for us to see. And in Oregon, I know that as a doctor, if I were to leave my practice, I need to write a letter to my patients. Yes. You have to give them at least a doctor, if not a list of a few to choose from. Right. Not knowing what the laws are in other states. Yeah. I think that would be hard too, if you're in a small town, if you're in an area with a small cancer center and you might have to go a farther distance. Mm -hmm. On that note, can I just say one thing that I forgot to mention? Yeah. When you get the second opinion, especially if it's at a center that's at a distance from your home, because being home, let's face it, is where you want to be most of the time. If it's at a longer distance, but it's a center of excellence, a lot of community oncologists will work with a specialist. They will defer to that doctor. So, you know, you can go back to your smaller oncology community clinic and have a treatment that might be recommended by the high volume, larger center in the city done locally. So I I didn't mention that. I think that's an important point because I do think that being home around loved ones is, is part of the medicine of healing. So being home is ideal. But some of those centers that you travel to, I know have housing available. And so asking if there is housing available, like in Indiana, they had Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. housing for patients who were receiving treatment, you know, if there's housing for family, if there are mm-hmm. discounts on hotel rooms, those kinds of things, seeing if that's available. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure people didn't think that it's like it, it's only black and white. You can do a bit of a hybrid type of treatment if you want to, you know, be home and get the best treatment possible. Right. Or, you know, maybe have a discounted way of, of staying closer to the more comprehensive cancer center. Yeah. Depending on your support system and where, where you want to be. You know, there's one thing that needs to be brought up that I, I'm, I'm very opinionated about this, and that is <laughs> you, <laughs> me, opinionated. One of the things that I think people should ask their doctor is, are there any markers, tumor markers, or other markers in my bloodstream that can signal the presence of the tumor? And This isn't a given for all types of cancers. It's commonly done for particular cancers like pancreatic cancer. There's a marker called 19-9. For ovarian cancer, they will very commonly do a CA-125 and do that routinely before treatment, during treatment, after treatment to watch for recurrence. The reason I want people to ask this really early in their treatment is it's not all of them are valid 100% of the time. So let's use breast cancer, for example. 
you can ask for a marker. There's a couple that are used. One is called 15 3, the other is 27 29. In any case, they don't always show up in the blood. So if someone has a breast lump, it's been identified as cancer, and they get a blood test done, the tumor marker is not always going to come up for 100% of women. It might come up for a certain percentage of women. For the women it does show high in, after treatment is over, you can take that parameter, that tumor marker test once a year thereafter. This is not routinely done and it's not recommended in the guidelines for a standard of care, but you could do this and you could be apprised of a recurrence much earlier than you would when you wait for it to show up in an imaging or wait for symptoms to develop over time. And yeah, those markers definitely do not show up in all patients, like with breast cancer patients. My markers were checked at my first appointment and they were negative and they were never checked again. Right. Because they were negative. So they're useless. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's no need to to check in the future for, for those markers. And that's another right. question is like, how come at my first test you checked for these and now you're checking again, you know, you're not checking anymore. It's right. That's why. Because if they're negative when the tumor is present, they will always be negative, even if you had a recurrence because your tumor doesn't make that particular protein. In any case, I saw a lot of people who never had any markers done that could have been done, but I saw them post-surgery and there's no evidence of disease. Running the cancer markers at that point, I have no idea whether it's a valid marker for that person or not because it was never established while the tumor was in place. So that sounds um, kind of obvious because from a logical, rational perspective, that's an obvious thing to do. But I will tell you, it is not standard of care. And you as a patient, need to advocate for this. So opening up that conversation and asking your oncologist, is there anything that can be measured while the cancer is here? Because once surgery in particular happens, that opportunity is no longer there to validate the marker with your given tumor. And these markers are different than like in breast cancer, like with then hormone receptor status, just those are, those are different markers. Right. Yeah. This is a circulating in the blood. So it's, it's a blood test that's done. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like this is one of those episodes that we could just keep talking. <laughs> this is going to be one of those 24-hour episodes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of discussion that lends itself to kind of a live event or something, right? It's like, how would I do this? Or how about this? And maybe maybe that's something right. we can do. Well, we will have yeah. a live event. Mm -hmm. At the end, yeah, at the end of the pod, after our, our next episode, the f week following Ideally, we will be doing a live and we can answer more specific questions and talk about more stuff. If nobody has questions for us, we'll just start winging it. <laughs> but yeah, so the next episode is going to be talking to your doctor about genetic testing. Yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a good discussion. When to ask about it? When is it appropriate? How's the system set up? We've come a long way in genetic testing. Yeah, we'll probably start with some basics and then move on to... Uh, the more complicated stuff. <laughs> and remember to check us out on Instagram and Facebook. And I tweet on occasion. Yes. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe. All of this helps us get to more people. Like us. Please like us. <laughs> <laughs> no, if, we, if you find this information valuable or you think it's valuable for other people, please send it forward and share it out there in the world because that's why we do this. We're hoping to help more people. And the more you share it, the more people we're helping. And if you want updates for when we put new stuff up on the website or any sort of updates that we might have, I'm thinking maybe sending something out once a month or maybe twice a month. I'm not going to send a whole bunch of stuff out, but email us. You can email us at the cancer pod at gmail.com and check out our website. It's still in the baby stages, but we got a website up. It's a fledgling website. It's a fledgling. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm Dr. Leia Sherman. And I'm Dr. Tina Kayser. And this is the Cancer Pod. Until next time. Peace out. Peace out. Thanks for listening to the Cancer Pod. Remember to subscribe, review, and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media for updates. And as always, this is not medical advice. These are our opinions. Talk to your doctor before changing anything related to your treatment plan. The Cancer Pod is hosted by me, Dr. Leah Sherman, and by Dr. Tina Kayser. 
Music is by Kevin McLeod. See you next time.